Thank you for joining us. I'm Dan Allen at Leon Springs Baptist. We love God. In fact, we love God supremely, and we love people, and we're busy making disciples. Those are the words of Jesus Christ and the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. We're praying that God's going to use us to bless you, to encourage you, and to challenge you in your walk of faith. Thank you for joining us, and we hope if you have the opportunity, you'll come and visit us Sunday morning at 9 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. At 10.30 a.m., we also have a Facebook Live and a YouTube option. Again, we love God supremely, and we love people. Thank you for being here, and we pray that God uses us to encourage you in your journey of faith. Good morning, everybody. Oh, I hope you're not through praising and worshiping because I know where we're going at the end. This is going to be good. Listen to this scripture. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but, but uh, you know, just thinking about the blood. Ephesians 1 says, in him, we have redemption. That means we've been bought back. Our slavery has been bought back and we've been set free. In him, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. I want to say something before we get into the sermon about why we sing about the blood. And as Tim said, we are a gospel preaching, a gospel singing church. And today, there's a whole lot of people, I would even say wolves in sheep clothing, that talk about the love of God and the goodness of God and the mercy of God and we're people of faith. But in case you ever move on from here, you go somewhere else, listen. Are they telling you about the blood of Jesus, which is his grace? In Romans chapter five, it says, this is what love is. Not that we loved him, but that he first loved us and sent his son to die on that cross. When we get so excited about the gospel and we say, his righteousness is ours. I have been adopted. I have, we're not saying we did anything. We're saying Jesus came and spilled his own blood. Now, why is it that way? I don't know. But that's why we have the Bible that says that is God's way of love and redemption. Always be at a gospel preaching and a gospel singing church. Amen? That was just a bonus, has nothing to do with anything else today, but that's a good one, right? So, it's our 50th anniversary. Many of you may have noticed something out in the lobby. Did anybody see anything out there? Okay. want to explain that to you, because we are not a fad-driven church. In fact, I wouldn't pay money for something like that, but here's what happened. I was talking with one of our members, Rob Wyckoff, who's right here. Raise your hand, Rob. Yep, I'm making you do it, Rob. Okay. Rob and his wife, Leah, come to church, serve here, and he was just telling me, we were just talking like Christians do, and he was telling me about how he, a couple years ago, decided to restore a DeLorean, just kind of, he needed something for a hobby. Really? And uh, his wife wasn't 100% on board, like, you know, because it's like, that's going to be expensive and take time. So he refurbishes the whole thing, gets it set, you can see it out there, it's from the movie Back, uh, Back to the Future. Not that DeLorean, but the, you know, the, the DeLorean story. And then a strange thing happened. People started wanting to use that car. State fair, UT, it's like, hey, if we're having kind of a celebration, they started paying money for that DeLorean, right? So if anyone wants to know, so, so at that point, I'm like, that's a pretty good story. And then Rob says, you think the church could ever use it? And I'm like, hmm. First I'm thinking, no. Then I thought, wait a minute, we got a 50th anniversary. That'd be kind of cool. So thank you, Rob Wyckoff. Um, the reason, reason we have that in a very small way is God keeps bringing people to this church who then are available, right? The basic theme of today is this. 
What name? What name do we want people to remember? 50 years ago, a group of people founded a church, and over those last 50 years, they have served the Lord faithfully. People have been saved. VBS has happened. Choirs happened. A lot has happened because those people serve the Lord. We don't remember their names. You're going to see pictures of them. But we know the name of God. We know the name of Jesus. In the same way, we're going to serve in our generation, but 20, 30, 50 years from now, people are going to look back at pictures. They're not going to know our name. They're not even going to remember the pastor. And that's okay. Because we're here to lift up the name of Jesus, right? That is the name we want him to remember. And I want to take you to a passage in Exodus 3 where God declares what his name is. So we're going we're gonna to get to Exodus 3, but I want to share with you a little bit more of the story, okay? Um, in fact, 50 years ago, 23 members went to the annual meeting of the San Antonio Baptist Association. They presented a petition to be officially recognized, okay? The executive director for the San Antonio Baptist Association was here in the first service. So they presented the, the petition, and in a classic bureaucratic whoops, they said, well, we don't have any record that you're actually a church. And so for the first day, they didn't recognize them, but they cleared it up, and the next day, they officially recognized this church 50 years ago, mid-October. Praise God. It began with a pretty small group. They were meeting in an elementary school in Leon Springs. Not the one you see now, but the old one. And folks, back then, this was the country. San Antonio was not inside Loop 16.4. It was all the way inside Loop 4.10. There was not a gospel-centered, gospel-preaching church out here. People had been praying. They started the church in the elementary school. Then they purchased this land for $12,000. Oh, that we could go back in time and say, buy more, buy more, buy more, right? But the decisions they made, the seed that they planted, we are harvesting those benefits. Take a look at some of these pictures. I'm going to tell you a few stories. This, as it says at the bottom, this tree was on this property. The early church members had worship service under that oak tree on this property. Isn't that cool? Let's go to the next one. This is the original sanctuary. Uh, You can see it was called First Baptist Church because isn't that what Baptists do? We're the first Baptist here. First here. First. I don't know why we do it, but that's what we do, right? First in Bernie, first in Fair Oaks, first in San Antonio. The original building, worship center is right there. Now, if you go out and you see that little green patch, that, that nice courtyard. On the other side is what we call the Soul Cafe. That was the original worship center. Okay, let's go on. This is a picture inside that Soul Cafe, the original one, and don't you love it? I mean, there's suit and ties. There's, there's a pews. There's the little table. Boy, did I grow up with that. If you were Baptist, you recognize all that. I love the banner at the side. It says, free because he lives. They didn't know, but here we are. Freedom biblical counseling, freedom in Christ, free. How cool is that? Let's keep going. Reasons to build. In the mid 1970s, uh, they had that building. Look at that little tiny parking lot. They started parking on the grass and they decided to do something together. We build. They decided they need a sanctuary with stained glass and all that. 39 families, after prayer, said, I'll sacrifice. And they built that sanctuary and some of the stuff that we live in now. They sacrificed. We don't even know their names, but Jesus is honored. Now this one, I love this one, 1981. So that's the new sanctuary with the chapel, the stained glass. On the roof is Christ is the answer. There's a local airport, a little small airport. Pilots can go over and they're like, I know that. People driving by, that's it. And notice, it doesn't say a fuzzy, God loves everyone. It says, Christ is the answer. I love that. Let's keep going. Like these two pictures, more sacrificing in the 90s. They built the education building. Um, Then they built the gym. I want to tell you a little bit about this next one, reaching kids for Jesus Christ our Lord. That's Debbie Burrier. Debbie's been with us a long, long time. Um, Well, (laughs) praise to God and thank you to Debbie. Earlier this year, I got a call from someone out of state 
lady named Stephanie. Stephanie had heard that a storm had knocked the roof off Debbie Burrier's house, and she wanted to make her sure her church was still taking care of Debbie, okay? But then she started telling me this story. She said, when I was 10 years old, my, my family didn't go to church, but we drove by that building. And my mom driving by said something like, you kids really need church. Stephanie, 10 year old, saw Debbie Burrier out there blowing up balloons for VBS. And she's like, I go to church like that. That'd be fun. So she came to VBS. She met people that love Jesus, but more importantly, she met Jesus at that vacation Bible school. Saved, baptized, went home. Her sister came, saved, baptized, living for God. The mother comes, saved by Jesus, the power of his name. Here we are 40 years later, and she's telling me the story about how her whole family is different because Jesus saved them. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. Next. On a lighter note, I hope. Next one. No? There it is. The arts, the early years. Tim will never do this to you, okay? <laughs> They're doing the best they can with what they had. But you got to love it. The guy, on, if you're looking at the three wise men, you know, with the fake beard, the other one, that other one in gold, that's John Nelson, our now <laughs> chairman of deacons. Isn't that great? John was saved in that building, and he's been serving the Lord ever since. What they did, we're now the beneficiaries of. They wouldn't want us to know their names. They would want us to lift the name of Jesus high. In Exodus chapter 3, a couple weeks ago I talked about why we built this. And you can go back and listen to the sermon. But the short answer is, we didn't have to build this. We had room in the gym. We built this because we did 40 days of prayer and fasting, and we believe God told us to build this for a specific reason, to reach people for Christ, to train people, right? In that sermon, I, I, I talked about how um, Moses had doubts, because when God speaks, you always kind of wonder. And Moses had said, well, how will I know that this is really you speaking and not just a good idea? And we talked about that, right? And God's answer was, well, you go do everything I say, you readjust your life, and you do everything I say, then you can bring them all back here. And when you're worshiping at this mountain, you'll know it was me. And I kind of laughed and I said, isn't that how God works? He says something to you and me that seems too hard, but we gotta, we gotta walk across that bridge of obedience. And then when we do, God shows and confirms his sign, right? Well, this is part two of that story. So in Exodus chapter three, there's a burning bush. Moses turned aside. He was willing. God spoke to him. He said, I've seen, I've seen what's going on. I, I've seen the agony. I've seen the complaint. I have. And Moses, I'm about to raise you up and send you to go do something about it. And Moses being like us said, um, 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 but God, <laughs> he said, but God, who am I that I would go to Pharaoh to the superpower of the world? Who am I? And God said, look, certainly I will be with you. The greatest promise in the Bible is God says, I'll be with you. I'll be with you in the valley. I'll be with you on the mountain. I'll be with you when you get married. I'll be with you when you're dying. I will be with you. God said, certainly I will be with you. And this will be a sign for you that I have sent you, when you have brought those people out of Egypt and you worship right here on this mountain. Next two verses. Remember, this sermon's about the name. Whose name are we lifting up? Whose name will they remember? Then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I'm going to say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. So he's saying, I'll, I'll do it, God. I'll do it. But he's got another question. I'll go to them. Now, they may say to me, what is his name? And if they ask me, what is the name of God? 
What should I say to him? And it's right here. God's personal name. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And then he said, thus you will say to them, I am, the great I am, I am has sent you. In Hebrew, that's four letters. We've added some vowels to it because the name was so holy that they wouldn't say it out loud. So they took the four consonants in Hebrew and then they took some vowels from another name, Adonai. They inserted the vowels and that's how we get the word Yahweh. A hundred years ago, they added another vowel and it was Jehovah. So when you say Jehovah, when you say Yahweh, you are saying the personal name of God. What's his name? That's my name. And folks, there is power in that name. Don't you dare take that name in vain. One of the top 10 commandments is do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I hate to hear people say God and then fill in the blank, and I believe that's taking the Lord's name in vain. But if anybody ever said Yahweh or, or Jehovah or they said Jesus and they added that, I'd just say, I got to get out of this room. Because there is ne that name, that name is salvation and love and power. That name is everything to me. And it should be to you. So, Turn with me now to John chapter 18. I want you to see how that name manifests itself in the New Testament. And oh, what a great story. We're, in, we're gonna be in John chapter 18. Um, but I gotta tell you along the way, Jesus uses the name I am. He basically makes it himself like six times in the New Testament. As an example, one time the Pharisees are like nagging at him and trying to, you know, kind of drag him down. And he says, look, this is Jesus. Jesus says, look, before Abraham existed, I am. That's what he said. Before, y'all are, y'all are telling me how great Abraham, before Abraham, I am. The Pharisees understood it so well, they reached down and picked up stones and were ready to kill him. There was no misunderstanding. Jesus is not saying I'm a good teacher. He's saying the great I am, it's me. He's the God man. He's God in human flesh. That's why we are never ashamed of Jesus or his name. That's why we declare the name of Jesus, say worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, but I get ahead of myself. John chapter 18. So at this point, Jesus, who knew why he came, he came to rescue us. I got to tell you, fingernails on a chalkboard is when people tell me, why does God send people to hell? What are you talking about? Jesus came to rescue people from hell. The only way you ever get rescued is Jesus. He didn't send anybody. That is a choice people make. Listen to this. It's, it's the garden. Jesus has had the last supper. He knows what's coming. Judas shows up, I'm in chapter 18, verse 3. Judas shows up, he's got a Roman cohort with him. Not a Roman soldier, a cohort. Roman soldier, swords, a whole group of them. Verse 3, Judas arrives with a Roman cohort and officers from the chief priest and Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Can you see it? Right? Right? Jesus had said, hey, Peter and John, hey, you guys pray for me, and they kept falling asleep. Here comes a mob. It's time. So Jesus, knowing, remember, this is all about the name. This is so, oh. so Jesus, knowing all things were coming upon him, all, he knew it. He went forth. He walks up to the crowd, to the Roman cohort, to the mob, coming to arrest him, and he says, who do you seek? Now, listen to what they say. They say, we're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. We're looking for the guy named Jesus. That's his human name. Jesus the Nazarene from Nazareth. And he says to them, he says to them, I am. Now, your version probably says, I am he. But you'll notice the he is in italics. That means it's not in the original Greek. That's so we can understand. What he said is, I am am the God who spoke to Moses 
the God of all eternity. Jesus says, I am. What? No, no, it gets even better. It gets even better. Hold on. I am. And Judas also was betraying him, was standing there. So you got Judas, the cohort, all this mob, weapons. And he said to this, when he said, if I'm in verse six, when he said, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Roman soldiers before their prisoner, all these officers, pharaohs, any Pharisees, they fell before the prisoner because he just said the name, I am. Is there power in that name? Oh yeah, wait, it's not over. It's not over. Therefore, the, he again said, who do you seek? Can you imagine? Uh, uh, we're looking for that Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am. He's using the very pronoun name of God Almighty. I am. And watch this. Here's why he's doing it. So if you seek me, you will let these go. So he had his disciples with him. And a prophecy, which is in verse 9, says, of those whom you have given me, I did not lose any of them. That mob wasn't in charge. Satan wasn't in charge. Jesus was in charge even at the moment they arrested him. Oh, don't ever be ashamed of the name of Jesus Christ. When Jen and the team get up here and say, worthy, worthy is the lamb, they're already doing that in heaven. If we could see the invisible realm, here's another story, Mark chapter one. Let me go back there. And in the notes that I leave out there, I have all these scriptures. So you can go read them yourself. Mark chapter one, way early in his life. Jesus is just starting and a, a man in the synagogue has an unclean spirit. He has a demon. When Jesus comes in, oh, if we could see in the invisible realm, we would instantly confess Jesus. Instantly. So Jesus comes in. There's a man with an unclean spirit and the demon cries out. It's in verse 24 of Mark chapter one. What business have we with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. The demons already know, and they're already submitted. Jesus rebuked that demon and said, you be quiet and come out of him. A couple verses later, the people are, it says the people were amazed. Yeah, I'll bet. But then they debate among themselves. What is this? A new teaching and with authority. Oh, there is name. I mean, there's power in the name of Jesus. Another scripture. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus is teaching us to pray. Because, hey, we get kind of confused. We start looking at our circumstances and we forget there's an invisible world and a God we will answer to. So, how do you pray? Jesus says, well, you do this. First of all, you remind yourself of who he is, our Father who art in heaven. What's the next one? Hallowed be your name. When you start your prayers, you ought to start with the name of God. God, your name is power. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. You are my father. You are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the God of all comfort. You are the father of mercies. You ought to begin your prayers with the name of God because the moment you start there, the rest of your prayer falls into place. Oh, there's power in the name. In Philippians chapter two, which is on the back of your notes, it says this. Therefore, God has highly exalted Christ and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You and I get to do that. We're gonna have tears of joy in our eyes. We're gonna be like, yes, yes, yes. Other people are gonna be like, Dan told me. I grew up in church. I didn't think that was real. And it'll be too late. Now you may think, oh, that's so emotional. Yeah, it is. There is salvation in no other name under heaven, Acts chapter 4. I am not ashamed of the name of Jesus Christ. By grace you are saved through faith. It's nothing you did. No works. You can't earn it. You can't be good enough. You can't buy it. By faith, you are saved through grace. 
Because he loved you. By his blood, by his grace. You're probably like me. You know all of this. You hear a sermon like this, I'm going to the mission field. I'm going to write, I'm going to tell everybody. Then a few days later, we have a fight with someone we like, and pretty soon we're looking at circumstances again. Does that mean that today wasn't real? No. What God says to you in the light, you don't doubt when you get in the dark valley. This is the truth, but going through this world is hard, isn't it? Peter got out of the boat, and he saw the waves and the wind. Jesus was right there, but he didn't look at Jesus. He looked at the waves and the wind. That's what we do. Today's a message that I hope will burn deep in your heart. So when you're in the valley, when you're in the storm, you'll just say, I know there's power in your name. I can't feel it. I can't see it. But I know there's power in your name. God doesn't want your correct thoughts. He wants the trust of your heart. So I will lift my hand and say, there is power in the name, and I'm calling on Jesus. I know when our kids got frightened at night, had nightmares, Amy taught them, you just say the name of Jesus out loud. Now, that doesn't make sense if it's not real. But how many of you have told your kids the same and seen it happen over and over again? They declare the name of Jesus and the peace floods their soul. Or the enemy rises up and pushes harder. And the enemy always overplays his hand. Oh, there is power in the name. Listen to what, a couple more things, then we'll wrap up. We have these ambassador cards. For some of you, you're already Christians. You're like, get to the point, Dan. I can't wait to sing. I get it. I get it. Some of you are on the fence. You're like, well, I want to be saved, but I don't want to get radical. And some of you don't even, you're like, this doesn't sound like what I grew up with. This isn't religion. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Have you confessed Jesus is your Lord? And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. That means declared not guilty, right with God. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. There is something about saying something out loud. The Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue and you'll eat the fruit thereof. At the end of this service, you're going to have a chance to say, no matter where your circumstances, you're going to have a chance to say, you are worthy. You are the great I am. You are the very, that is your name. You are the great I am. You know, in that song, the great I am, it says, the mountains shake before you. You're going to sing that. That's going back to Exodus 19. Remember, we started with Moses, burning bush. What's your name? The great I am. Moses goes to Pharaoh, does all the miracles, comes to the Red Sea. Now we're back at the mountain. God says, now Moses, go tell all the people, consecrate yourself. Three days, consecrate yourself. Make yourself holy, right? Get set aright. And then come up to the mountain, but don't cross that barrier. You cross that barrier, you're going to die because I'm a holy God. I'm light and you got darkness in you. So they come and they're all around Mount Sinai. And the Bible says, on Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments are going to be given, fire comes down. Fire? Wait a minute, in Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, wasn't it also fire? And it was tongues of fire. And it came inside us. Well, in the Old Testament, fire came down on that mountain. And it says smoke went up like a furnace. And it says the mountain quaked. At the name of the great I am, the mountains shake before you. I believe that also means the mountains in your life. That circumstance that won't change, that health issue, that that sin problem, that whatever it is, that mountain that won't go away, that mountain shakes before the name of God. And he will remove it and cast it into the sea. It'll be in this lifetime when he's ready, Or when we get to heaven and we'll say, God, your way was right. 
Because even though that mountain didn't go when I wanted to, you were with me and that was more than enough. Right? In that song, the mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. Well, we just read that. The demons do. They already know. James chapter 4, verse 7 says this. If you and me would submit to God and resist the devil, the devil will flee. The demons run and flee. That's not just a song line. It's the truth of God. Next verse, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. So we're about to wrap up. For those of you that sitting on the fence, you need to stop sitting on the fence. God can do so much more with your life if you turn it over to him. You're going to have so much more joy and peace, power and trials and challenges and growing. I suspect there's many people in this room where you're at is kind of what I go through. I think we all go through. We come here and we're like, yes, the great I am. But then we've too often gone back and taken our eyes off of him and looked way too much like the world. Messed up again and again and again. I'm here to tell you that I, as your pastor, and every Christian I've ever met goes through that same cycle. Same doubts, same ups and downs. What I have found is with maturity, you get up quicker. With maturity, you say, I'm going to believe the promises of God, not my guilt. The Bible says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So why are you condemning yourself? The Bible says, be holy for I'm holy. I can't just not change. Right? We're about to sing a song that's a declaration. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. What I want you to do is uh, Jen and Tim and the team sing. Stay seated for the first part. Just listen to the words. I want to be close to you. Make that your prayer. Just say God, I agree. God, I agree with that. Yes, that's me. And you know at the right moment when to stand up and just declare the power of the name. I want to pray for each of you and for myself. There are mountains, proverbial mountains that are like, God, I've been praying for that and it's never changed and I don't know if it's going to change. I don't even know if I want to pray anymore. Let's pray for that mountain to quake today. Okay? Let's pray. The Bible says that God is working all around us and God is working in you. So I want to urge you to respond to God's truth. And if you're looking for a church home at Leon Springs Baptist, we are a healing place in this hurting world. We're equipping people to serve God. So I want to invite you to join us at 9 a.m. or 1030 a.m. on Sundays, or you can catch us on Facebook Live or YouTube Live at 1030 a.m. And I want to end by saying God loves you and you can trust in the goodness of God. Thank you for joining us.